morning. <clears throat> we are in uh, First Peter chapter 3 today, reading um, verses 8 through 22. Let's pray. Father God, um, we come before you this morning uh, very much in need of your guidance, your mercy, we pray that you would continue to show us grace as we read your word. Help us to understand what we read. Help us to submit to what we read. And help us to understand that in all things we are, as everything else is, subject to Christ's authority, whether we obey him or not. Um, so we pray that we would honor him, that you would give us the strength and wisdom to do that. Please be with us as we read your word. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Okay, um, three, first, first Peter 3, 8 through 22. Finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteousness, or on the righteous. And his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring, to us, bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison because they formerly did not obey. When God's patience waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight persons, were brought safely through water. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Okay. First Peter. What do we see here? Um, as always, there is a lot in Scripture, and it would be very easy for us to um, go off on... Uh, possibly inappropriate tangents if we don't start with observation. So, all right, let's observe. He says, to have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, tender heart, and humble mind. He says, don't repay evil or revile, but bless so you may be blessed. Uh, keep your tongue from evil, turn from evil, and do good. He says, um, Actually, he quotes um, Psalm uh, 34, I believe, and says, um, the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. He says, if you suffer for righteousness sake, you will be blessed. Um, be ready to defend your hope. Have a good conscience so those who revile you, your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Uh, he says that Christ also suffered the righteous Christ for the unrighteous. 
He co then compares baptism to Noah's ark as an appeal to God for a good conscience. And then he closes this chapter by saying that angels, authorities, and powers have been subjected to Christ. Okay. So, what can we come to understand and apply in our lives from this scripture? Okay. So, right off the bat, he's calling for unity of mind. But he's saying, finally, all of you. So, he's taking into account things that he's already talked about. He's concluding thoughts here. Have unity of mind. Okay. So he's been talking about submission to authority. He's been talking about being built up into a living, um, a living uh, temple, right? A spiritual house or spiritual sacrifice. All of these things he's been talking about. He's saying finally. All right. So um, the question in my mind as I re read this, he says, "Have unity of mind." Um, unity regarding what? Because there's a lot of things that we can have unity over, um, but they're not necessarily all what he's calling for here. People can have unity of mind concerning acts of evil. I think bank robbers or um, people attacking others and, and seriously harming or killing them. They may actually have unity of mind in those acts. That does not mean that those are righteous, godly acts that follow what Peter's commanding here of Christians. Just having unity is not enough, logically, right? So what are we to have unity concerning? Sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, a humble mind, those things, um, I think, obviously are part of that unity, right? Have unity of mind, which might include sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind, right? So those things could be what we, we are to have a, uh, unity around. He goes on, though, um, to quote Psalm 34. Whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Okay, so truth, that would be truth. Uh, let him turn away from evil and do good. And so that's, that's righteousness. Then let him seek peace and pursue it. Um, that's interesting to me because it doesn't say let him, he will find peace, but he will at least seek peace and pursue peace. It may or may not be found, but he's pursuing it and seeking it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So righteousness and truth is what we're seeing in Psalm 34 that Peter is quoting. So I, I believe that, that unity of mind with the sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind are then coalescing around truth and righteousness. Okay. Truth and righteousness should be the prime focal point. And out of that truth and righteousness, we should have sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Those things are the way that we seek peace and pursue peace, which hopefully we find. Hopefully we find peace as we pursue it. But even if we don't, we must be telling the truth, keeping our lips from speaking deceit, right? And we must be turning away from evil and doing what is good, which is righteousness, because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. Okay, so that's that's the unity. And then he, and then he moves on to say, so because who's gonna who's gonna harm you if you're zealous for what is good? Well, that's a good question, and and if. We lived in a, an ideal world. There, there would be no harm that came to people who did good. 
but the problem is there are people who actually unite around things other than truth. People who unite around lies, uh, deceit, who uh, unite around unrighteousness. And so when, that's, when that is the case, harm might come to those who are righteous, who are zealous for what is good, which he acknowledges here. He says, but even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, right? So you, you can suffer for being righteous. You will be blessed. So there's blessing. Um, he tells, tells him to, to, to um, honor Christ, be ready to give a reason for the hope, right? For the hope that is in you. And what is that hope? What is the hope that is in us? I think that's key here. Because if we're going to suffer for, for righteousness and, and basically not benefit on earth, potentially, for being righteous, what is the hope we have? Why would we want to do that? Why not unify around evil and just live how we want? What is the hope that we have that being righteous and unifying around truth and righteousness will actually do us any good? Well, he answers that as well. He goes on to say that um, having a good conscience so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior, right, your uh, good behavior in Christ, that's key, may be put to shame. So you will be justified. You will be shown to not be at fault. You will not be put to shame. It's better to suffer for doing good than to suffer for doing evil. But, but how will we not be put to shame? So we have good behavior in Christ, that's the righteousness that we may be suffering for, but still, how, how is it that we're not put to shame? What is the hope? What is the hope for Christ? Right? Verse 18, for Christ also suffered once for sins. And then he goes on this really, I mean, kind of it, pretty cool, but kind of confusing passage at first, where he's kind of comparing baptism to the flood, but then he says, baptism saves you, um, and, and it's an appeal to God for a good conscience. What does that mean? I thought we were, I, I was under the impression that baptism doesn't save. Well, I think what he's talking about here is this concept, if you remember in Matthew, uh, we talked at, at one point about, um, and also in Genesis, about Christ being the ark, right? Um, like the ark was foreshadowing of Christ, saving from judgment. And I think if we keep that in mind as we read through this, um, it might become more clear what he's meaning. He says, um, while the ark was being prepared, right? So when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, so judgment was withheld. While the ark was being prepared to save some, a select few, the elect that would be saved from the flood, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through the water, the water which was the judgment of the people of the earth on the earth. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So, can baptism actually give us a good conscience? Well, let's look at the, the comparison here of, um, of the, the flood scenario to the being saved by Christ in baptism. So, what saved Noah? So, I would argue the ark saved him but it was because he had faith, right? So, here, so Christ is the ark, but he's also the one who give, God gives the faith um, to Noah so that the ark can save. And the ark is evidence of the faith. So the saving is evidence of the faith. Is this making sense? I think I might be getting a little um, ahead of myself here, but... Um, Think of it this way, Noah, good conscience, because he has, he believes in God, 
Um, so he escapes the flood, he's saved, and his revilers are put to shame. Right? All the people who mocked him for having faith in God are put to shame. Now if we look at us, we have a good conscience because we believe in God. We've been given that belief. And then when judgment comes, which will be the final judgment, we'll be saved and revilers will be put to shame. So what is the saving element? The ark for Noah and Jesus for us. The ark is evidence of the belief and our belief in Jesus, which we show evidence of through baptism, is our ark. And the only reason we can have a good conscience is because we have been made right in Jesus. So when we stand at the final judgment, we stand with a clear conscience and escape that judgment and are not put to shame. This all hinges around Jesus. Now, he is the one who saves. He is the one who gives us the faith, the ability to have the unity of mind. And the unity of mind is regarding what? Truth and righteousness. And we only have righteousness through Christ. So once again, we're back to Christ here. I think we're seeing a pattern here. Jesus is at the center of all of this. Truth, unity, righteousness, all the, the humility or the humbleness, the humble heart, the sympathy, the brotherly love, those all come from Christ as well. We can't just have these things apart from Christ somehow. We can't just have them apart from truth somehow. We can't just have unity as a church apart from the righteousness of Christ and his commandments. If we have that, if we find that, we will not be in Christ. We will not be in the ark, per se, and we will end up shamed. We will be put to shame because we will not be in the truth and we will not be righteous. We will not actually be in the ark. We would end up finding ourselves on the outside, unfortunately, the ones reviling those who are in the ark. And we know how that turned out. So what is the reason for our hope? Is the reason for our hope unity? Or is the reason for our hope Christ's righteousness? Clearly, it's Christ's righteousness. He is the ark. This whole parallel between the flood and baptism is showing that it's, it's, it's Christ that is the ark that is saving us. He's also the judge, by the way. I mean, all things are, are Christ's. He is the one who is in control as Peter ends this chapter. And he says that all things are subject to Christ. All angels, um, he is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. Subjected. So there's that word again that he used earlier in the chapter, subjected, which... Um, does not mean necessarily obedient, but it does mean under the authority of, right? Christ has the authority to judge, the authority to reward and or punish. Okay, that's what being subject is. But we need to be really sure, really clear on what we are to unify around. Simple unity is not enough. In fact, if we unify around the wrong things, we may end up being on the wrong side of judgment. So we need to unify around what the Bible tells us to unify around, truth and righteousness. Okay. So, the... Takeaway for, for today is this. Truth and righteousness are to be the focal points of Christian unity. Simple. <laughs> Truth and righteousness are to be the focal points of Christian unity. Let's pray. Father, um, God, help us to continue working through these uh, sometimes difficult concepts. Help us to find the things that are clear and simple and straightforward and to grab onto those, like the fact that truth and, truth and righteousness should be our unity, but to, to, to take those truths 
and continue to work out the, the concepts that are harder with the way that um, the way that we are saved but also grow into our salvation the way that we are sanctified which is a, a hard and, and long arduous process you know, give us wisdom and strength to continue that process and to honor you in that process as we encounter your word give us the humility to to be subject to it and not only subject to it but obedient to it God, we pray these things for ourselves and for those around us and please give us a heart for those who do not understand what unity is that it is not just oneness of mind but Christian unity is being one in Christ, which cannot be apart from truth and righteousness. Please help us and, and help those around us. We pray for your mercy. We all need it. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. Have a great day, everyone. See you again.